Welcome to First Christian. We've been working hard to create an experience online to help you approach this holiday and celebration and with a lot of joy. This has been quite the year. And if you've been with us since COVID began, you worshiped with us online for several months before we rotated to having both online and on-campus worship opportunities. This entire year has upended so many of our expectations and rhythms, but in it, there are so many things to celebrate. One of those things is your generosity and your compassion toward people in our city who are in need. Almost immediately after schools closed in March, we met with school leaders in our city alongside dozens of other church leaders with the express purpose of making sure our kids in Council Bluffs were cared for. Those conversations turned into the church in Council Bluffs partnering with schools to feed kids every single day for months. That's incredible. We want to give a huge shout out to Thriving Titans, which is a food pantry that cares for kids in the Lewis Central School District. After COVID happened, they needed a place to stay and keep all their food so that they could continue caring for kids in our city. A few phone calls, conversations, and some quickly cleaned closets later, we were able to host Thriving Titans permanently in our space. They have been such an incredible blessing to host. We love their hearts for caring for struggling families in our city, and it seems that they are on our campus every single day, working to make sure that every kid has food to eat and clothes to wear. We've been able to partner with them a few times to help maintain their pantry in the season as well. I want to celebrate your generosity and your compassion in providing gifts for kids both in foster care and who are affected by homelessness this Christmas season. You bought hundreds of gifts for kids who have so little, and Mom's Place and Share My Smile both have been able to provide those gifts for kids who need hope and dignity this season. And so, we come to Christmas, the celebration of the greatest gift we could ever receive. How Jesus gave us hope because he was born as a child, giving up the majesty of heaven for the lowliness of earth. And we don't want this holiday to be about us in any way. And we think generosity can be a huge part of making that happen. So this year, we are partnering with the First Baptist Food Pantry to help provide food for people in our city. The pantry saw record numbers last month and have served thousands of people this year as people have lost jobs and lived in the incredible uncertainty of 2020. I've loved seeing their creativity in adapting to the needs of their clients, making sure that everyone not only received food, but understood that they are loved and they have purpose. This is an incredible ministry, and we are grateful for the chance to bless them this season. After the service, you can go to the website myfcc.life and see how you can give this week. Even if it's a small gift, that means another meal for someone in our city who is in need. This Christmas service is going to look a little bit different. We're going to sing some songs, both familiar and new. We're going to listen to different stories that help us understand the beauty and the wonder of that holy night so many years ago. We're going to share in a moment of communion together at the end of the service, so feel free to grab a piece of bread or a cracker, as well as some juice, so that you can join in with us at the end of the service. My prayer for tonight is simple, that God will use these moments in a way that is both a blessing and a challenge, that you will feel pulled into the story of the birth of Jesus in a way that brings you to a point of worship and celebration. And now... We're about to begin. Take a moment to like this video, say Merry Christmas in the comments, and hit that share button right now. Invite your Facebook friends or text the link to someone who you think will enjoy a chance to celebrate this holiday. And now, welcome to our 2020 Christmas at First Christian.
Children weep no more. Hope is on the horizon. Weary world, behold your promised Messiah. Angels, let your soul. chill in the air that morning of 1847. Placide turned the page as the sounds of hooves on cobblestone filled the air. Coming to the end of the chapter, he slowly closed the Bible he was reading, then sat back in his seat and sighed, thinking about the task before him. The local priest had approached him and asked if he would be interested in writing a song for the small town's Christmas Eve mass. Placide had been taken aback. A poet by trade, he had never written anything for a Christmas service before. 
And he found himself saying yes, though he wasn't sure why. Now in a carriage bound for Paris, he sat reading the birth of Christ as told by Luke, hoping for inspiration, hoping to make sense of the words dancing around his head. Placide closed his eyes and listened to the rhythm of the carriage wheels. He began to quiet his mind in the passage he had just read. And as he recalled the verses describing that first Christmas night, to his great surprise, he was there. He could see everything. The small town of David, the shepherd's field alight with the glory of heaven, the stable where the sounds of livestock found themselves in competition with the cries of a newborn. He could see the manger where there laid the baby that would one day change the world. And all at once, the words swirling in his mind began falling into place. He opened his eyes, reached for his pen, and began writing as if he was about to lose the words completely. By his arrival in Paris, he had chorus and verses completed with an opening line of three short words. O holy night. Placide approached his friend Adolphe, showed him the poem, and asked for his assistance. Help me bring this to life, he said. His friend got to work crafting a melody that was haunting yet beautiful, that crescendoed into a grand chorus. And after a few weeks' work, he brought the new carol to the parish priest, who gratefully added the creation to his service. The song was sung Christmas Eve morning to the delight of the small congregation. Tears filled people's eyes as they lifted their voices and sang about that holy, divine night. And as the last chords rang through the sanctuary, there was an air of glory, of divinity. People left the church feeling as though they had been there that holy night. Placide was pleased to hear of the song's success. He sent a note to his friend thanking him for his time and talents, then added the song to his repertoire. Imagine his shock when later on, the priest that had requested the song informed him that the song was no longer to be used. Some of the regional leadership had found out that Adolphe was a Jew and Placide an atheist, and that was enough for them to deem the song unfit for a church setting. Placide was devastated. The song that had come to him as if by a miracle had been pushed aside but one decree could not remove the song for people's memories. They had fallen in love with the song that so perfectly reminded them of that night where a rundown stable was filled with the glory of God come to earth that cried out for them to fall to their knees and hear the angels sing. There was a comfort in those simple yet powerful words. The song spread as its incredible message and melody captured hearts and gave people hope. the 
John Sullivan Dwight added another log to the fire burning in his office fireplace, then turned to his wooden desk in the corner. He paused, taking a deep breath against the spiraling dread he was beginning to feel. As he sunk into his leather chair, his head rested heavily in his hand, the conversation from that night's dinner table echoing. There had been new reports of the growing instability and anger in the country as states and politicians faced off more and more over the issue of slavery. America of 1855 was at a standstill, with half the nation saying slavery was a God-given right, while the other cried out in anger over what they saw as the dehumanization of their brothers and sisters. In that moment, John fought back the hopeless and helplessness he felt. A fierce abolitionist, John often wished he was doing more. You probably could have if you had stayed with it, he told himself. John had studied and was ordained as minister after he finished college. He had visions of leading a church that would bring God's word to masses, but there was a problem. Prone to panic attacks when put in front of a crowd, John struggled to find the words if he could speak at all. Consistently at odds with his own fears, he began finding solace in the works of classical composers and music in general. So after a little recollection and a lot of prayer, he had changed professions and began publishing a successful music journal. The work suited him and brought him happiness, but what good was it doing for anyone? Then his eyes wandered over to the corner of his desk where a piece of paper rested on the top of a pile of handwritten work. He reached for it and smiled when he saw what it was, a French carol that he had just finished translating to English. The song had not found favor with the French church, but John could not understand why. He was drawn to the melody that in the verses danced and waltzed through the air, to the grand chorus that demanded the singer raise hands in adoration to heaven. 
Just like Placide and the people that Christmas night did before him, John felt enveloped by the words. He too was there, in the stable, standing shoulder to shoulder with the shepherds who had just seen the angels sing, falling to his knees at the feet of the newly born Savior. But John saw more. When he worked, he always rested in the third verse, which declared that chains shall he break. For the slave is our brother. And as he read it again for the hundredth time, his eyes were lifted from the manger to a cross, a cross where a blameless son of God and man would one day give it all, facing hell and winning, just so God's creation could be restored. So everyone, no matter who they were, could come into the presence of God and be welcomed. This was the world that John craved, a world where anyone, regardless of color or race, class or influence, was seen as the child of a loving God. Suddenly, John knew what to do. He had a column to finish that night, and in that moment, he had the words. Instead of reviewing the latest classical work or writing of the recent performance of Beethoven's symphony, he published the verses and chorus of the carol, and so introduced America to O Holy Night. A short while later, John was out walking when a young man came up to him. Are you Mr. John Dwight, he asked. When John confirmed, the gentleman shook his hand. I loved the song lyrics from your last issue, especially the third stanza, he said, then paused, tears threatening to form. I hope you don't mind, he continued, but I gave my issue to my neighbor to read. John smiled. Not at all. Thank you for your kind words, he said as the man went on his way. After a silent word of thanks to the father for his inspiration, John continued walking. In the years leading up to a war which was to be fought between brothers, those that craved the same restored and redeemed world as Mr. John Dwight firmly embraced the song. As they sang, it helped them look forward and hope, rejoicing that God's law is love and his gospel is peace. The young French soldier grabbed his helmet, heart pounding, and buried his face as the barrage of bullets kicked up the dirt around him. Off in the distance, there was an explosion that shook the ground. This is it, he thought to himself. This is where it ends. He couldn't tell you how long he and his fellow soldiers had been there, but it was long enough for utter despair to overcome the group. They were pinned down by German troops and the ensuing battle in what would later be known as the Franco-Prussian War of 1871 had left French and German alike exhausted and afraid. The young man laid in the dirt, sure that these were his last minutes. And as often happens in these kinds of circumstances, his mind began to review his wealth of memories, which immediately sent him to his favorite place. His mother sighed, 
listening to her sing. His mother sang all the time, even if she were her only audience. I wonder what she's doing right now, the young man thought. Knowing her, she was probably keeping busy, all the while humming to herself, stopping only long enough to offer a prayer for her son. And now that it was Christmas, she had an excuse to bring out her favorite carol. You know, she would always say mischievously, the church doesn't like this song. And then she'd wink and begin the first verse, her vibrato echoing through their tiny cottage. He loved when she sang this song, not only because of her angelic voice, but because when she sang it, he would be transported. And soon he was following her through the streets of that small town to the feet of the newborn king. And as he fell on his knees at that manger, no matter how hard times in that cottage had become or how scared he was, in that moment, he was happy and he felt peace. That's the hope our Savior brings, his mother had told him many times. How wonderful is it that the new and glorious morn happens every day now that our king came to earth? Another rumble shook him from his memories. He didn't know what it was. Maybe it was stupidity, maybe it was hysteria, maybe it was sheer desperation, but he couldn't take it anymore. The young man stood up from the dirt and began walking forward, ignoring the screams from his captain to get down. With voice shaking, he began to sing of a holy night, of stars brightly shining. I just want to be there, he thought. I want to feel hope one more time. A bullet flew past his ear. He just sang louder. And as he began the second verse, what he heard was surprising. The other French soldiers were adding their voices one by one from where they sat, many wondering how they knew the words. Gunshots slowed to a stop as the melody filled the battlefield. And when the song had reached its last note, the French troops sighed and turned back to their guns, ready for the fighting to resume. But then they heard the most incredible thing. German voices raised together in a beloved hymn by Martin Luther. It had been a shock to watch the French soldier begin singing during a battle. The Germans, thinking it was part of a trap, froze, not knowing what to do. Then finally, one of their men who knew a little French spoke up. It's a Christmas song, he said. They just sang about it being the Savior's birth. Lowering their weapons, the Germans decided to offer one of their own hymns in response. When the last stanza of the German song had ended, the French soldier looked across the battlefield. The German soldiers nodded, and the young man nodded back in understanding. French and German troops put down their guns, and for 24 hours, the fighting ceased to allow each side to celebrate Christmas. And in that moment, they felt the thrill of hope and a weary world rejoiced.
three stories in one beautiful song. Three examples of people being affected not just by a melody and lyrics, but by who they represent. A king that meets us in our brokenness, takes our hand and brings us back to him. The words of Advent, hope and love and joy and peace, are just as relevant today as they were 2,000 years ago. The Apostle Paul says the good news this way. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We long for relationships that are not marred by selfishness or bitterness and betrayal. We long for a world without conflict, but the peace that passes understanding is an inward sort of peace with our Father in heaven, where a broken relationship is restored and the emptiness of life is replaced with a thrill of hope in Jesus. You can have that peace this Christmas. You can receive the gift of Jesus as your Savior. I invite you to take the next step in knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, and we'd love to go on that journey with you to answer your questions and point you towards the God who laid down his life for you. Take a moment and talk to us in the chat or go to myfcc.life and, and we'll find peace together. And for those of you who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, um, we not only remember his birth, but every week we share in communion together. So I invite you now to get a piece of bread or a little cracker and some juice, and and we're going to share in communion together. You know, 33 years after Jesus was born, he willingly died on a cross as a payment for our sins because he loves us that much. And three days later, he rose to victorious eternal life so that we could also have eternal life with him. On the night that he was betrayed, he he took some bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, it's broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup and he said, this is a new covenant, my blood is poured out for you. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for this time that we had this evening to find strength and hope in the middle of this weary world. God, I thank you for the peace that you offer us. A peace that passes understanding, a peace that makes us complete and whole when our lives are so broken and marred. God, you are great, you are awesome, and we love you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will to men. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. to the world we will sing 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 such a powerful way to celebrate the coming of Jesus. Each song and story pointing to a God who had so much compassion on us that Jesus came to earth to live among us. I pray that this time has been a blessing to you. And if it has, here's our request, that you share this video with someone who needs to be encouraged today. We want this holiday to be one of joy and worship, but we know a lot of people are having hard years and this might even be the first Christmas they're spending by themselves. Let this be a part of how you encourage and bless people around you. 
hit that share button, let them know you're thinking about them, and invite them to into this experience as well. I spoke for a minute at the beginning of our service about giving toward the First Baptist Food Pantry as part of our Christmas celebration. This amazing organization helps care for and love the people in our city who are in need, and they've seen record amounts of people coming through their doors. Would you consider giving even a small gift toward their efforts? What better way to celebrate the gift of Jesus than to bless others in this season? And you can find out how to give online at myfcc.life. We're hosting our worship service this Sunday, December 27th, online only. If you're wanting to join us, you're welcome here at 10 a.m. We'd love to have you join us. We love you. Let us know if we can be praying for you. Remember to give and ask any questions at myfcc.life. And we'll see you this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Have a very Merry Christmas.